Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In order to talk about fluid dynamics, we first need to discuss the idea of a control volume. So a control volume is just some volume that we've defined in space. Usually it'll track some geometry of interest, like the interior of a pipe, or perhaps some arbitrary volume around an airfoil. It can be any shape we need it to be. Typically, we're interested in some quantity inside our control volume. That might be mass, momentum, or energy, but it could also be, say, the number of particles in the system, or maybe the amount of charge. The key idea is that we're looking at some amount coming in and some amounts going out. For this talk, I'm gonna just focus on mass for a couple of reasons. One, it's relatively simple. We have a very clean idea of what the mass per unit volume is. Second, mass is neither created nor destroyed, unless we're talking about some sort of nuclear physics, which we're not gonna worry about in this lesson. So if there's no creation or destruction of mass inside, all we have to worry about is the mass coming in or the mass going out. So the change in mass inside our CV is going to be equal to the mass flow in minus the mass flow out. We can write this in terms of density as the integral over the volume of our density times dv. So now let's try to figure out what's going on with our mass flow in and out. So let's look at this surface right here. I'm going to call it surface 1. So that means that we're going to have some v1, some velocity 1, we're going to have some rho 1, and we're going to have a area 1. So if I draw this area, and I draw the volume of mass that's coming in, we can get the volume just by multiplying the area by this length right here. Now velocity is length divided by time, right? So if we multiply our velocity by some delta t, some amount of time, then we can actually get a length here, which means that we can get a volume. So I'm going to call this distance right here just v1 delta t. And so we'll end up with our volume coming in as a1 v1 delta t. In order to get our mass flow in, we can just say that this is rho 1 multiplied by our volume. Okay, now let's look at our second surface. I'm going to call this a2, call this v2, and say that we have some rho 2 associated with it. So things are just a little bit different this time because our velocity is leaving at an angle. In this case, we have some highly angled geometry. The length of this line is still just v times delta t and we're still looking at an area A2. The volume of this geometry is not V2 delta T A2. It's A2 multiplied by some H, which is measured directly normal to our one of our surfaces. So our volume out here is actually A2 multiplied by this H. Now in order to calculate this, we're going to need some vector that defines the normal direction. So our h is going to be not just v2, but a v2 dotted with this normal vector multiplied by our delta t. So by using the normal vector, what we're measuring is now no longer just the velocity itself, but we're measuring how much of the velocity is aligned with the surface going out. So looking at it over here, only a portion of the velocity is actually causing fluid to flow out of our control volume. Some amount is just making it move up and down on this surface. V2 dot into is accounting for that. Okay, now we can write our mass flow out. And this is going to be rho 2, A2, V dot in, delta T. All right, one more thing to change. This equation only works if all of these are constants over our surface. So if we want it to be more general, we can actually write this as an integral so that things would be allowed to change. We can take the integral over S2 of a whole bunch of differential areas. So we're going to have some dA. And on that dA, we'll have rho 2 multiplied by this v2 dot n2. But instead of having our a2, this is now a differential area. We still need to multiply by this delta t. We can do the same thing for our mass flow in. This is going to be equal to the integral over S1 
just like down here, we'll have rho Vn multiplied by dA. Rho 1, D1 dotted with N1, dA, delta T. Now this normal vector in 1 is going to be pointing away from our surface. That's just a consistent direction so that we're always the same with our normal vectors. So B1 dot N1 in this case is actually a negative. So for calculating the mass flow in, we need to include a negative sign in this dot product. So now let's write our mass flows uh, in a more organized way. Now that we have these, we can attempt to write out our original equation. I'm going to say that the change in mass is equal to some delta M. And the right-hand side is going to be this negative integral over S1 minus the integral over S2. Now we're getting close, but we're not quite there yet. So the first thing I want to do is divide by these delta t's. As our delta t, as our time goes to zero, we can actually say that this change in mass over time goes to the partial derivative of mass with respect to time. Now it's important that this is the partial derivative for a couple reasons. The biggest is that if we're looking at the substantial derivative of mass, that includes the idea of mass changing over space and time. Now, if we're tracking mass over both space and time, we just said that it couldn't be destroyed or created. So that means that this is identically zero based on this idea of conservation. But if we're looking at just the partial derivative of mass, we're only focusing on how it's changing over time. So the partial derivative is looking at just the change of mass inside our control volume. So now let's rewrite this equation using our definition of m from above. Let's also combine all of our surfaces. Now up here, I'm only looking at surface 1 and surface 2 because those are the ones that we actually specified some velocity on. If there's no velocity on these others, then this integral just becomes zero automatically, so we don't have to worry about it. But we could theoretically have some additional velocities on these other surfaces. So if we want to include all of them, we can write this as the integral over some surface, and the surface we're interested in is every surface of our control volume. So we can actually write this as a closed surface integral. And this circle, all it means is that the surfaces that we've chosen enclose completely a volume. So we've accounted for every single surface. And we can write this as the more general rho times b dot n dA. Okay, we said that this equation here, this derivative, the material derivative, accounts for both the local change and the change due to movement, change in x, y, z. Well, that's exactly what we have down here. So we can actually say that the material derivative of all of our mass in the control volume is equal to the change in time, assuming that we're keeping our control volume exactly the same, plus the change due to things coming in and leaving. Now for mass, this is equal to zero. If we were thinking about some of these other things, we might have some other forces for momentum, or energy sources for energy, or so on and so forth. So this right-hand side may not be zero for every extensive property, but we can write that the change of some extensive property, I'm going to call this Aleph. So Aleph is a Hebrew letter, which is nice because it doesn't get in the way of any of the Greek letters we usually use. But I'm using this to mean some extensive property. So something like mass, momentum, and energy that changes as we change our volume. And this is going to be equal to the time derivative of this integral of the intensive property, which I'm just going to use eta for. The right-hand side of this equation will depend on what exactly our extensive property is and what our domain looks like. This concept right here, where we track some extensive property and split it into the change with respect to time and the change due to things coming in and out. This works for anything. And it's also the foundation of a lot of analyses for fluid dynamics.